Yeah, it's interesting. I think uh, I think a couple of things. One thing is I definitely don't think that you start necessarily in the most logical place. I think you just it kind of starts depending on who's doing what and where there's a potential for people to work together. And like when I came back to Colorado Springs, it was not my intention to get involved in food system cooperative organizing that went, but as I kind of figured out where people were active and where the possibilities were and where there was the most kind of energy, it was clear that that was the place. So that became kind of where I focused. So I think it just depends a lot on that. It also depends totally on the different communities, different situations. So like in New York, I know from a couple of worker centers, immigrant worker centers that I worked with there years ago, you know, they, it was a domestic worker cooperative because they had a lot of domestic workers who were members of the worker center. And that was a kind of scattered and disorganized type of work that in a way created a real opportunity for organizing it into a worker cooperative. So, you know, that was, that's kind of where they started in terms of cooperative organizing. So I think it's just, it's going to be really, really different. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's my dog putting in her two cents. It's just going to depend a lot on the situation and then on the particular folks involved. Also in Chicago, you know, that street vendors association that, you know, created a cooperative kitchen so that they could um, do their cooking together and then go out and independently sell food on the street. Um, that's another interesting example of something that just grew out of a community worker center approach mm -hmm. arose out of a particular situation. Yeah. Which makes me think, you know, and probably maybe this should be the obvious answer, a little embarrassed. I didn't think of it. And it, it immediately it was, well, maybe the place to start is with like, it's some kind of needs assessment, surveying the community, talking to people, seeing what they don't have that they need um you know kind of doing that that sort of thing um and you know maybe you discover something like the you know uh, cooperative kitchen for street vendors or something like that um you know another but another good place uh, or is in terms of just co-ops that i i thought was a, maybe a good place to start was with a uh investment cooperative and matt you're involved in one of those down in colorado and you know it, it seems to me and i don't know that i can point to any particular examples but that you know it, it, especially for like a if, if you want to fund a housing co-op you know i mean any of these other co-ops are going to start like they all require funding and so you know finding a group of like-minded people to maybe start you know putting some money into a fund to uh, be able to help you know and that you know, uh, with the funding might be a good way to start out. And then you can, you know, be getting to know each other uh, while you're just raising funds before starting on a project. I don't know, Matt, you're like, this is a <laughs> bad idea. I'm just, I'm just smiling because I'm like, yeah, it's a terrible idea. Because <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because yeah, we have this thing, the Colorado Solidarity Fund. It's cool. It's great. I'm glad to be a part of it, you know. Uh, so not a good way to start cooperative organizing. Like it's a good thing to have it <laughs> available. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad it exists, but I don't, I don't think it works that way. Also, I mean, in part because that whole sort of idea that Luis Rossetto preaches that, you know, you don't need money to start a co-op and that that's putting the or getting the order wrong. Um, that's you know, whatever, there's a lot to talk about in that, but there's something to the idea, to that, that I think is an interesting argument. But the other thing that I just wanted to throw in is this guy I've been, I just read his book, this guy, Euclides Andre Manse from Brazil, who wrote this book, The Network Revolution, um, has a whole, he's got a whole schema, which is a really interesting argument where he says where you should start is in communities of people who are unemployed or underemployed. And the way you should start out is by getting people together to do the food purchases they already do collectively. 
start forming a buyer's club and then start buying, organizing yourselves as a cooperative and then start buying in bulk and doing the things that allow you to save money and then also use that co-op to generate a solidarity fund so that you can start then giving little bits of support, but really you can then, and also to use it to do a needs assessment among the members and then figure out what needs can be met by starting new worker co-ops in the same community. So it's a whole kind of like self-generating co-op organizing model, starting with the money people are already spending. So you don't need outside money. You just need to dedicate that money. Oh yeah, that's funny. Like the Community Purchasing Alliance. I guess it's similar, right? I need to know more. I remember I talked to folks from the Community Purchasing Alliance, but I've forgotten exactly how their model works. I'm Isn't not it churches? At all familiar. Chris, Maybe are you familiar Quaker. with the Community Purchasing Alliance at all? No, but if Quinn can type it about it more, I think I think Jim is familiar with the Community Purchasing Alliance. If it's the one that's based, if it's the one that's in New York State. But yeah, I was actually thinking about doing that today um, with some of the new folks that have arrived from um, Venezuela. Um, so let's see, Quinn wrote, yeah, I think they start by paying for trash services for churches. Um, yeah, I was, I was thinking about how to help some of the folks coming in from Venezuela. And uh, I was thinking about, well, I have my, I have a Sam's Club card. Um, and uh, I don't even use it, but, but I just buy almonds. That's all I <laughs> use it for. Um, but I would just be a matter of coordinating it or if they have some groups, maybe just like donate something to them to get it started. And maybe they can start saving money from there and see the value of um working together to do that uh but i'm glad you brought it up because i didn't get to finish that because i think my revulsion of my car and the sam's club kind of stopped my thinking um but yeah I, and i gotta think about it more how to how to make the most of that too and i mean it'd be ideal if we could redirect it where we're not dealing with sam's club um uh, yeah uh Cool. Yeah, I mean, at, <laughs> on a, at some point, you just got to bite the bullet and, you know, understand that there is no uh, ethical consumption in capitalism and, uh, you know, do what do what works. Um, but I really like this idea. I mean, it's a, you know, of kind of starting just cooperatizing the stuff that everybody is already buying anyway. Um, yeah, and then yeah, and, and, and building from that, you know, it's, it's, uh, creating savings. Um, and I don't know how this would work. I mean, with um, your typical Americans who grew up in this country. <laughs> um, but one thing that does seem very popular and common uh, with a lot of immigrants anyway, um, is like the Susus, right? This is relatively low, I mean, you, you create a, a savings group with a group of people that, you know, everybody puts in a certain amount of money every month or every so often. And then every month, one person gets paid out the full amount and, and, uh, you go around in a, in a round like that. And, um, you know, and that uh, is, um, you know, something Carolyn, uh, Hossein has, uh, you know, done a lot of, uh, work on up in Canada. Um, and, you know, uh, she was saying that you know, the, the kind of uh, second generation folks, you know, his parents immigrated uh, to Canada and now they're there. They've been um, kind of expanding on the Susu idea and kind of bringing it into the more like the digital age. And uh, and, uh, you know, so, you know, things like that. You know, I just, I've thought I have not ever personally managed to put together, convince other people to do a rotating savings <laughs> group. Like I said, I don't know how this works with like Americans. Like sounds good to me, but we seem far few and far between, but for fo people from other cultures that might be a little bit more uh, into this kind of stuff and might be, able, you know, it could be a place to start. That's funny. Yeah. I've been looking for takers. 
for a Rosca or a Susu mm -hmm. or whatever. And nobody's ex excited about it as I am. I'm like, man, let's just try it. It'll be great. But right. yeah. can't, I can't find anybody. Everybody's kind of like, hmm, people are cautious, especially if it's money. Mm. But, yeah, I you will know, another, can I throw in another distinction yeah, yeah. That's, that I found fun from this guy, Monse? He says he distinguishes between survival, like uh, you could you could think of it as like survival cooperation, like what you do just to keep it together, and then subsistence cooperation, or you know, where you cooperating but you're not progressing in a huge way, but you are kind of able to sort of live your life in, to some extent that way. And then he talks about liberation cooperation, and I feel like that that it's helpful to think about those three categories. I feel like. Because yeah, they're very different. You know, when you're practicing survival cooperation, that's kind of a different deal. Okay. Ooh, look at Quinn. It's got another point. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Quinn says, I've been daydreaming about organizing a Rosca for disabled people. We have lots of restrictions on our ability to save money. It's also just a nice way to bring folks together around mutual aid. Lou, um, I want to know more about the restrictions on ability to save money. Is that like the... Like I know one problem... Being on SSI, I would imagine. Right? right. There's restrictions on how much money you can make, right? There's a whole issue mm -hmm. about. I'm pretty sure, and Quinn can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure there are also limits on the amount of money you can have in a bank account. Um, I, oh. This has been a problem for some friends of mine uh, on SSI that, you know, it's like, oh, good news, you you know, distant uncle, well, good news, some distant relative passed away and you get like $5,000 or something. And it's, yeah. a, and it's a disaster. It's a disaster because right. if that money actually shows up in something that, you know, is for them, like they could lose a, a bunch of benefits. So um, it, it, it's part of that catch 22. Quince uh, says, yeah. yes, exactly. exactly. Okay. Both income and savings are restricted. Yeah. Due to SSI. Um, yeah. So, I mean, well, Quinn, uh, you know, here's the thought, and this is, you know, coming from a, a self-described anarchist and, you know, I'm, I'm, I am not a lawyer, <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is why these Raskas are popular with immigrant communities. And what, you know, Carolyn talks about yeah. a lot is that they don't, um, they get discriminated against often from financial yeah. institutions. And so they prefer to do things off the books, as it were. And so this is yeah. a way of, of doing, um, uh, you know, if it's cash transactions, you know, you, right. you, you, you obviously probably, you know, maybe want to keep some records among yourselves, but, you know, if you're just passing cash around and it's uh, staying in an envelope in, under the mattress or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're good. The other thing I know that we, I saw her in uh, Toronto in June at the, at the at a, co-op conference and they also told the story that like and maybe it's we've covered this in geo i don't remember about how uh you know they had this really successful rosca going and it was like you know pretty significant amount of money and they're like we need to just put this money in the bank so they tried to create a bank account for their rosca and as soon as the money went in it was seized by the police who thought it was some sort of money laundering scheme because they're like, who are all these immigrants with all this money trying to get everybody's name on the account? They just, it wasn't usual. So they found that. Uh, and so it was another version of that discrimination again. It was like, you know, even if you try to do it, um, opening a regular bank account, et cetera, et cetera, they're still going to come down on you for being who you are. So, yeah, I think that's, but I don't know. Yeah, there's no reason. I mean, uh, there's nothing. A Rosca by itself is no, it's not, it's not an investment tool. It's, there's nothing that would need to be regulated. It's just mm -mm. friends moving money around amongst themselves. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I would, you know, and the problem would be for, you know, when the month that you get paid out, if that goes into a bank account, then, um, you know, like I said, that could, that could mess with things, but cash yeah. exists. Um, so yeah. I, <laughs> I'm a big fan of that. Um, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so Roscas. 
what else? What are some other threads on this that we can pull on? Um, the, the, they mention in there the um, Wi-Fi or like broadband co-op. And yeah. that uh, is something that also I think is not just a rural area issue. Um, and I know of uh, at least one project, and I'm sure there's others uh, doing like creating community free Wi-Fi uh, services uh, in a co-op kind of manner. Looks like we got another chat coming in. How could a person living in a rural area contribute to the efforts of creating co-ops? Maybe try to establish a close connection to their closest small town and city. Hmm. This is, um, well, I'll tell you in Montana, I live in rural Montana and, uh, I, you know, it was, pretty easy to make a connection with the Montana Cooperative Development Center. Um, easier to make a connection than to get a whole lot of help out. And they did, they were helpful, um, but are also like super busy. Um, mm. But, you know, uh, you know, making, because the, they work all across the state and <laughs> mostly in larger places than my little city of 500 doesn't really rate. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I, that is a good idea. I hadn't thought about, oh, maybe I should drive over to Plains and, and start hanging up some flyers over there. Um, but it, that is, you know, one of the main issues we run into in rural areas is just the lack of people, right? There's not that mm -hmm. many people. And if this is something that only 5% are going to be into or 2% then yeah, it gets pretty thin pickings pretty quick. So, um, I don't know. That's, uh, it's not probably a good answer, but it's all I got. Matt, you have any thoughts out? I mean, you're not I mean, really from Colorado. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting because well, it's hard to say, you know, like there's like there's much more co-op activity in some rural towns in Colorado than there is in Colorado Springs, which is the second biggest city. So it's not like automatic that there's going to be more in a small town or, or in a city mm -hmm. um, at all. But I can see like the, the main thing I feel like at the beginning, it's just consciousness that this even exists as a possibility is a really big, that's our first stumbling block is because we have people who will create something like a co-op. They don't know that there is this great Colorado co-op law. They don't bother to make them co-ops. They just start a whatever and they invent a form that <laughs> using standard business mm -hmm. legal status purely because they don't know that there's any other alter alternative. So I feel like some of it is just like, yeah, exposure and being aware that there are people out there who you could talk to and ask about it. I think the peer to peer thing is really good here. If you can find somebody to talk to, um, yeah. you know, in that nearby town or, or wherever who has some experience. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in some ways, you know, there are advantages to being in a smaller place in, in a sense that, you know the play it's easier to know the players there's often just more there's not as much big wealth around so there's not as many layers of people being pulled off by all that big money there's i feel like there's a little sometimes if it's agricultural there's more a little bit more of a culture of helping each other out and it just seems to me to be the case in some of the towns in colorado compared mm -hmm. to our city